evangelist. <laughs> Question number three. Do the Gospels accurately preserve the activities of Jesus Christ? I want you to pay careful attention to how Craig is phrasing his answers because he's a very smart scholar. He says that the Gospels are in essential agreement with one another, and we can pretty well know what Jesus says. He quotes E.P. Sanders about how uh, we know what Jesus said. E.P. Sanders agrees with me that there are discrepancies among the Gospels and there, are, uh, there is unreliable information scattered throughout the Gospels. And I want to know if Craig agrees with me because he says that the Gospel writers adapted the words of Jesus. That means they changed the words of Jesus. If they changed the words of Jesus, then how do we know where they've changed them and where do we know we're actually reading the words of Jesus? The same thing applies to Jesus' deeds. Can we trust what the Gospels say about what Jesus did? If the stories about Jesus were sometimes changed as Christians told and retold the stories as they adapted them, how do we know that they weren't changed a lot? before the Gospels were written down? Or are we to think that all four Gospels are 100% accurate with respect to Jesus' activities? If they're not 100% accurate, how do we know that they're at all accurate? And if we don't know how accurate they are, why should we trust them as historical sources? My own view is that it is absolutely certain that the Gospels did not give an accurate account of the things that Jesus did. For one thing, once again, there are many discrepancies in the accounts. As you can see for yourself, simply by reading them and comparing the Gospel stories for one another. Take any story in any of the Gospels and compare it in detail. Just do it yourself. Compare it in detail with the same story in another Gospel you will see multiple differences. During Jesus' temptations, what was the second temptation? To jump off the temple or to bow down to worship Satan? Matthew says the first, first Luke says the second. If one of the authors felt free to change the details of the story, how do you know that he didn't feel free to change the substance of the story? Did Jesus ride one animal into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry, as in Mark, or did he ride two animals, as in Matthew? Did Jesus have extensive conversations at his trial with Pilate, as in John, or was he silent except for uttering two words, as in Mark? How could it be both? But sometimes the stories are not simply different in minor detail. They are sometimes different in major ways. Let me give you just one example in the couple minutes I have left. Jesus, on the way to his death, in the Gospel of Mark, is completely silent. He carries his cross, or Simon of Cyrene carries his cross, and Jesus doesn't say a word. They nail him to the cross, and he's silent. He's hanging on the cross. Both robbers mock him. The passers-by mock him. Everybody mocks him, and he doesn't say anything until the very end he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. That's the end of the story in Mark. Not quite, because then he gets raised from the dead. But how did he feel at the end? Compare that with the Gospel of Luke. In Luke, Jesus is not silent on the way to be crucified. He's going to be crucified, and he sees some women weeping for him by the side of the road, and he turns to them and says, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children for the faith that's to befall you. Jesus, in Luke's gospel, is more concerned about these women than he is about his own fate. When being nailed to the cross, in Luke's gospel, he's not silent. He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. In Luke's gospel, he's hanging on the cross and he has an intelligent conversation with one of the robbers. Only one of the robbers mocks him in Luke. The other tells the first robber to be quiet because Jesus has done nothing to deserve this. He turns his head to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replies to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. 
In Luke's gospel, Jesus does not feel forsaken the way he does in Mark. In Luke's gospel, he knows he's on God's side. God is behind the proceeding. He knows what's going to happen to him. He knows why it's going to happen to him. He knows what's going to happen to him after it happens to him. He's going to wake up in paradise, and this guy's going to be with him in Luke's gospel. And at the end, rather than crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't say that in Luke. In Luke's gospel, he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he dies. This is a very different portrayal of Jesus going to his death from Mark. What everybody does, of course, is they take Mark's account and they take Luke's account and they smash them together into one big account. So Jesus says everything that he says in Mark, everything he says in Luke, then you throw in what he says in Matthew and what he says in John, and you end up with the seven last words of the dying Jesus, which you find in none of the Gospels. You are free to do that, to smash them all together. So that Mark's portrayal isn't right, Luke's isn't right, what's right is the one that you've combined. But realize what you've done is you've written your own gospel, rather than trusting any of the gospels of the New Testament. The problem is the gospels of the New Testament do not agree either on the sayings of Jesus or on the deeds of Jesus.